Hi and welcome everyone. This is a very special episode of Seek Sustainable Japan and I have a very special group of guests in the first section. We are going to do four sections of 30 minutes with amazing guests that have already been on the show in one of the first 500, you guys can say. You're in the top, top 500. 500! <laughs> it's a big, yeah. it's a huge Ooh. surprise. How did it happen? I don't know. I'm as surprised as everyone else. Thank you so Very much for impressive. joining everybody. And thank you so much to my first section talking about business. You guys are all Tokyo experts and insiders doing amazing work. Thank you so much for joining. Yay! Yay. Thank you <laughs> for having us. us. Yeah. yeah, privilege. So I, you know, all of us were connected uh, when Tova and I decided to do the Women Inspire event. We were all involved with that. So that's that's a really that was one of my big events since I started my own business. So it was great to have you guys in the first section. Thanks so much. <laughs> yeah, and no, thank thank you. and can I get the first congratulations? Congratulations! What yeah. <laughs> five hundred episodes? It's crazy. <laughs> it's so much hard work, so many people, and I know you doing all these kind of connections and bringing people yeah. together behind the scenes as well. Uh, so a big heartfelt thank you from yeah. the whole community, JJ, for everything you do. And how does oh. it feel? It, it feels unreal. Like how? How could I possibly have had 500 episodes? I don't believe it still. Coffee? How many years has it been? How many, <laughs> lots of coffee. How many years have you been doing it? So basically like started with some on-site like interviews with people from 2019 and it got kind of got me started thinking about it. And then I decided from 2020 um, to try to do the live show to get the audience more engaged, um, to keep it transparent in that way too. So people can ask questions. Speaking of which, if you are watching live, you can ask questions and make comments anytime. We would be happy to add you in. But Joy, um, that's almost like over a hundred a year. That is such an incredible accomplishment. <laughs> that's it really most is. Spartan. Spartan was three hundred, but you're five hundred. <laughs> so good. Yeah. I mean, there were, I was looking back, there were some times like during COVID, like during the lockdown, I was doing talks almost every day. Wow. Yeah. 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 Well, so that, that that really racked it up. Yeah. I was going to ask, so would, would you have got here without COVID? Is this a kind of a, a blessing of yeah, COVID? Really? Definitely, definitely. Mm. Yeah, I never, well, I never would have been at 500 now after mm. only about two years of doing it uh, without COVID. So that, that kind of relates to one of the questions I wanted to ask you guys. Uh, have you Tokyo business people, have you noticed a shift since COVID? in how people are working? Are they valuing more like work-life balance or are more people working from home? Are you seeing any changes? Uh, Definitely. Yeah, go first, Tova. Yeah, I think um, it was interesting because at the beginning, I remember speaking to a friend who was working at, at Cowell at the time, you know, big Japanese mm -hmm. organization um, in the, she was in the corporate culture um, sort of part of that. And she was saying, you know, until COVID, there was this whole concept that it just wouldn't work. Working from home just couldn't possibly work um, in Japan. Um, and then it happened very, very quickly. And everyone, because the, the company's values were so deeply embedded um, and they said, look, you know, in order to keep people safe and, and to work um, effectively, we need to do this. And she said it just took a couple of days and there was a complete turnaround and they went mm -hmm. completely online yeah. it was really impressive to see a lot of large companies actually manage that very very well and then it's been interesting to see what has happened since and you know whether they've remained more flexible and open to it i know some clients that we work with have started saying no come back to the office and there's been a real pushback actually from employees who've said well no that that's not the most effective way to work and we can be really effective outside the office and have a better work-life balance and get to see our kids and and things like this and i think um it's shifted people's mindsets and so a lot of the companies that we speak to are more open and more flexible now and i think employees are beginning to demand it more and, and be um more sort of vocal about what they want for that which is i, I think a very encouraging thing 
Yeah, I'm going to jump in on that. I agree with Tova. That's my uh, impression as well. I haven't got any sort of data on it, but um, just anecdotally, there's the companies which are basically have gone back to pre-COVID, essentially, and probably not a lot has changed. Mm -hmm. And then there are others who just just never, basically, you know, genie's out of the bottle, never going back. Right. It's actually better this way. Yeah. Um, caring for, for your... Um, other people in your household um actually you know those couple of days a month where it's really really hard to get to work um just you don't have to yeah um and it's you know i think it's just opened up this whole other way of being like a, a company or your relationship with your employees so really but there's yeah. probably there's probably lots of companies falling in the middle where mm -hmm. you know it's got it's not completely free but there's a kind of I, i've heard a lot of the kind of like two days a week flex time but three days a week kind of minimum I, I don't know how you, you know that how that's going. To be honest, I'd be it'd be interested to hear. But I do think um, that was one of that definitely was one of the blessings. That's sort a of legacy um, yeah. of the COVID era. And I just to sort of to to pick up on Tova's point about expectations of employees. Mm. Um, I think this is a really interesting area that does come back to actually sustain sustainability um, mm -hmm. and company transitions because what employees expect from their employer is definitely shifting and yeah. they've got yeah. more agency now than probably ever before and the gen z because they're the smallest demographic um they've got the most agency and kind of like buying power as, a, as someone or say yeah if they're selling their labor it's the other way around but you know they've got um you know if they they used to kind of stick it out at a big um, famous Japanese company, even if they didn't like it, mm -hmm. or they would go and get go and work for one, but now they're just um, they're not. They can look at the re reviews of what it's like to work there online, which <laughs> yeah. are becoming transparent, right? They, you know, they yeah. don't need to do it themselves, and if they don't like it, they'll leave. And so they're kind of they're a new generation. I think actually, if you're looking for like stimulus to change decision making in Japanese mm. companies, actually that younger group sort of basically saying, well, I'm not down for this. Right. It is one of the key ones. But what do you think, Ruth? You you have yeah. loads of high level clients. Yeah. So I'm involved with a whole bunch of companies. And I think that the easiest way to say it is that it's getting very real for mm. Japan. So every time I would do speeches up until now, it was sort of like, oh, okay, mm -hmm, that's what it's going to be like. But now when I go into any kind of speech situation, it's like, please tell us what to do right now. You know? <laughs> like, it's happening now. And I think that um, Japan, it's always said that uh, Japan will often move due to pressure from the outside. Yeah. And uh, right now, basically, in order to hire good people, hire good Japanese kids out of schools, out of universities in Japan, you have to have the remote option. So mm -hmm. people in the interviews, the, the young group in the interviews are asking, so how many times do I have to come into the office again? You know, and that's like a really big point. Mm -hmm. And then the other huge change that's happening is the international investors. Since yeah. the yen is uh, cheaper, the yen is weaker and weaker and weaker, all these international investors from around the world are looking at the prime companies. And when they invest in these companies, you ready? They have the rules that they have to follow in their home country in order to invest in a Japanese company. So all the ESG stuff, all the DNI stuff, all the sustainable parts, those have now become criteria for these outside companies to invest in the big Japanese companies, which literally forces change at the board level. So yeah. I feel like, you know, just as concluding on my point is that Japan is in the middle of actual internationalization right now. We've been mm. thinking about it. And I think, Joy, your ability to bring this whole community together, all of us internationals, really sort of like fundamentally changes something in this country. And um, I have one more point to say, but I, I'll wait until the towards the end. So we will <laughs> talk. Tova, you are nodding. Or Joy, please, we'd love to hear from you. No, no, I love it. I love it. You guys have so much great insight in the business world. And I think Tokyo is where we're seeing changes first. Maybe. And where, where I am in Hiroshima or other smaller cities, we're going to see it after. Like all, I, the, all the big changes seem to happen there first. Can I challenge that? Yeah. Go so for I it. think I think you're right about a whole bunch of stuff. Like so maybe in terms of employment practice and stuff, that internationalization mm -hmm. effect and let's say the you know, 
DEI or Jedi, that that pressure that Ruth was talking about with the portfolio manager mm -hmm. having basically to hit targets across their portfolio and looking at the HR practices as part of the you know the S of the, I mean that's definitely hitting those big multinational companies that are exposed to the international. But actually, in some ways, like there's so much money flowing through the big cities you know obviously you know all the economic stuff aside there's still much so much capital um and i i feel like actually some of the times i've gone and visited places like kagoshima in, in kyushu yeah. or you know um smaller smaller towns and provinces where actually because of the declining population the declining tax base they have they're having to be more innovative right exactly um, yes and, and as actually you know the kind of uh the exchange value of land and you know buildings and stuff like decays to zero then it's just the use value and what you can yeah. do with it that takes over and that actually creates way more freedom and like you mm. know repurposing of spaces of buildings um using like basically your labor in different ways and and sort of contributing to the community so i, I in some ways think that um you'll see more let's say rewiring of the yeah. social fabric that's you know getting our company's sort of yeah, uh, founding <laughs> metaphor in there but i think you might see more reweaving of the social fabric actually mm -hmm. fundamentally in the regions where the rubbers hit the road on some of these yeah you know, really it'll be issues. like more obvious i think that probably tova you're going to say something about this but um last year we saw the most the highest number of international people coming to live in japan than they've right. ever seen before it was mm -hmm. over three hundred thousand mm -hmm. people in one year and so um, there's talk and people, these experts are thinking by 2030, 10% of the entire Japanese population will be non-Japanese. Hmm. And a lot of this, like you said, um, is going to be seen very clearly in the local regions because just very you know, clearly, if you have 10% of a very small population now non-Japanese, it's much more obvious because yeah. all these Japanese companies all over the country need more people and the visa requirements are changing, right? Isn't that happening, Tova? Absolutely. It really is. And I know, um, particularly speaking to some of our big sort of hospitality clients, they've been sort of very frustrated with the um, sort of the difficulty of getting visas for, for people. You know, they, they can bring in people from outside. Um, one person I was speaking to, a uh, GM of a large uh, sort of hospitality, very well-known one um, in mm -hmm. Japan a few weeks ago, was just saying that he, um, you know, it, it's not that there are not non-Japanese people who are willing to come and work here and interested. Um, it's at the moment what's, sort of slowing things down is getting them visas um, right. and he had a case where he had a chef I think waiting uh, for who was Indian but had been based in Singapore before waiting for eight months to get his ah. visa and he said this is crazy you know come on yep. we need these people we need to be more open to that um, and I think you know I, I also agree what James is saying is it's not just in the big cities and the big organizations too it's really at a local yep. level impacting very very hard um particularly when you've got elderly populations right, right. And they really need care workers they need manual you know laborers that's mm -hmm. very much a sort of a, a younger person's remit and if the japanese you know younger population is just not big enough um or not sort of looking to to work in those areas and coming more into um the the urban sort of centers then you know we need to look elsewhere and be open to that and that's going to be a, a big shift i think in terms of structure and and you know the way it needs to work in terms of policy level but also yes. just for people and their mindset and and how are we integrating these people into communities so it's going to it's a big shift well i think the next 20 years in japan is going to be very difficult because it's mm. the first time it's not just going to be the cute guy kokujin over there that you think is interesting <laughs> It's going to be somebody that you actually work with, that he yep. lives next to you. So it's when all the, the friction is going to start over the next 20 years. Mm -hmm. So people like us in this community can really sort of smoothen that transition, I think, hopefully even just a little mm -hmm. bit. 
would be great if we could do that. I don't know what it's like in Hiroshima Joy, but in Tokyo, they now allow you to take the taxi driver test in 18 different languages. Oh, wow. Oh, that's so cool. It used to be yeah. only Japanese. That's you had to have a certain yeah. level of Japanese to be a taxi driver. Now they're giving the actual official test in 18 different languages because you have that little, what is it called, where you can translate with the little machine. So everybody can just see a <laughs> Google app. Get the Tokyo. Yeah. Okay, okay. <laughs> so you can just use that little machine now. So literally when you're drive when you're riding around in a taxi or trying to stop a taxi in Tokyo now, a lot of the drivers are not Japanese anymore. That's a hmm. huge change. One, one other thing I noticed when I was in Tokyo recently, uh, James, you had this great event that Ruth and I went to, and uh, you had some great speakers talking about gender as well. And the first thing I noticed when I got in a taxi was advertising, showing women shachos, women heads of company, uh, telling their staff what to do. And I thought, this is new, you know? <laughs> so in terms, in terms of gender equality and gender balance, you seeing the boards also talking not only about how to have more accessibility or inclusion for international workers, but more equal opportunities or promotion or equal pay for women. Is this something you guys are seeing coming up? Equal pay will take a bit longer, I think, <laughs> because that's not being forced out into the open yet. Once it's but at least they're having to declare. Like, is it? Mm -hmm. Are they declaring? Mm -hmm. Okay, well, I don't know. I yeah. sit on three boards and I don't really, mm, I'm still questioning. Because I think the uh, there's lots of different reasons, but one of the reasons is because the uh, corporate environment isn't friendly to a woman who needs flexibility. So yeah. a woman who needs flexibility cannot work the same amount of hours as one of the guys. So obviously her pay is going to be lower. So we just have to break the current system and then rebuild it in terms of salary. That's what I think. But um, opportunity, I definitely think that's changing. I think more women, if they want to, they can be a manager. They can be a division chief. They could even be, you know, CEO if they wanted to. I think it's really um, sector specific as well, as well, right? So if you like... Yeah. You look in some areas like, you know, sort of marketing, consumer goods, right. areas of tech, it's really, you know, you're getting parity. But then there's these whole swathes of the economy, like construction or something, where it's just like, you know, it might as well be 1950 still, right? Right. Um, so right. I think it's very sector specific. And I think, um, you know, that's also because of that labor squeeze we were talking about earlier. I think that's, you know, they're going to wake up to the fact there's this yeah, amazing gonna have to wake talent up. in half the population yeah. that just like are not like being attracted to their their yeah. um, sector anymore. And well, you I'm know. thinking that basically mm -hmm. salaries for everyone in Japan are too low. So we <laughs> went through deflation for so long. When you look at salaries overseas, whether it's the C-suite, whether it's a regular worker, these people who have graduated from graduate school in Japan are getting a first month pay of like 260,000 yen as their base pay. Mm -hmm. And so I feel like we have to raise it for everybody. And um, then you can also kind of enforce equality there. That, that, you try to that was my pay yeah. when I was a jet yeah. in 1991. Mm -hmm. Like that. Yes. That was the standard pay. And it really mm -hmm. hasn't changed. No, it has not changed. In 30 years. Tova, did you have a comment about gender? Um, well, just to sort of echo what, what we've heard already. So I think um, we mentioned in our, our monthly live stream uh, last month that I'd just been at the um, Morris Sadali event with BCCJ and sort of talking about this. Um, Melanie Brock talking about her experience on various boards and what she was seeing. Um, and definitely progress. We are seeing more. We've got to go beyond the, the one or two sort of token uh, sort of women on the board because um, you know one of the things that we know from organizational change is that you need a certain sort of critical mass if you like to to make a difference if it's just one or two it's very difficult to actually have a voice um, and speak up on there and we're seeing a lot of really amazing people but quite often the same names coming up on boards you know, again, we need to broaden out, um, you know, that pool. Um, but that takes time. You can't just sort of jump straight into a board position. It takes a lot of experience and preparation so that, you know, we, we've got to start giving people opportunities, I think, giving women more opportunities much earlier on to get involved in strategy level conversations and things to build up that sort of understanding and experience um so it 
would be good to see more of that because at the moment there's a lot of excuses oh well there's just not enough women sort of to sit on the boards or or to be senior leaders um but yeah i mean yes you can hire in sort of mid-career from from other industries other sectors but we also need to companies need to be looking in their own pipeline and saying Mm -hmm. are we giving people the opportunities to to go and get the experience and the skills that they need to develop that and allow flexibility um so yeah it's still it's moving in the right direction but i think there's an awful lot more progress to be made well japan's still like what hundreds i think we slipped 163 or something in the ranking for gender equality i I mean there's a lot more work to be done but yeah Yeah. i think i mean and yet number of graduates are are pretty much equal or, or even slightly more um yeah can I just throw one in there? Maybe this is a bit of a question for you guys. So um, we're quite involved with the B Corp movement here. Um, it's been, you know, I'm not sure how familiar, you know, this audience is with the B Corp movement, but um, we've, I think it's a really, it has a lot of potential in Japan because I think um, ESG is, you know, it's, for one, it's it's framed through investment. It's, it's basically a, a risk assessment framing. Yeah. Um, and it's also, it has got quite a lot of sort of assumptions about you know what a society should look like that are baked into it and that those mm. are quite european and you know kind of what you might say is pro- you know progressive from their terms and and not necessarily inclusive and i think one of the you know and there's you know you hear a lot of moaning and whinging which i which tova was mentioning that i'm not i'm not saying i'm not saying that's like you know that they're right um but i think the b corp assessment framework is actually more flexible and it's a yeah. way for companies to tell their own story um you can't get away from sort of like statistics like you know basically how you know what share of income is going to female employees versus and you know things like that so it's um but it's yeah it's, it's basically something i think japanese companies could embrace more and more and we had um a few months ago the official launch of the um the sort of being market builder which is a kind of um sponsored by the whole um network um tori san um um has is leading that and she, you know she's an amazing advocate for um for that community and the, the sort of transitional um potential it has so i wonder what you guys think is it something that you can see catching on in japan i, hope I would so. hope so yeah you know, <laughs> Have you have you heard of it, Ruth? Be no, <laughs> I'm so okay. sorry. I don't think. No, I've heard that's of it. that's fine. It's this it's becoming bubble, yeah. more common in Japan, but yeah. I think internationally, it's it's a bit more well known. It's a like a basic foundational uh, strategy and consulting to get you to a decent level to think about being a sustainable business and how you could be better. And as long as you hit the certain standard, uh, you can be listed as a B Corp, right? Yeah, you, you got to get above get it, about, right? You got to get above. AT um, to be, get get a listing, and um, you know you've got famous. I think the biggest in Japan is Danone, um, yeah. the French mm-hmm. uh, company. Um, Patagonia would be another, you know, really famous one. Um, so yeah, it's. But a lot a, more, a, a lot options. more travel companies now are being mm-hmm. listed with B Corp. Uh, I've noticed travel platforms in Japan, tour companies. So that's good no. to see. <laughs> yeah. So, um, Joe, can we ask you some questions? Yes, yes. Um, I don't want to run out of time before you All get right. a chance to plug your event, James. Oh yeah. Uh, do you want to just oh, yeah, mention, mention your big well, event? So, coming do you up? want to start start the story off with Car- with Carol and your the way that you supported her initiative first? Yeah. Okay. So I I interviewed her as well, thanks to Tova. Yeah. And uh, Tova, you and James uh, met with her and helped her strategize. And now yeah. you've got an event coming up with her, right? Cool. Yeah, okay. So so Carol Fuchs. Good. Do you want me to go? Or, so Carol Fuchs is um, climate activist and um, very knowledgeable on climate, well, climate scientist. She's based at the, the British Embassy in Japan, um, working on climate science there. Um, she's also a sort of world-class athlete who's who's climbed Everest um, without supplementary oxygen. Wow. Um, and so she spends all her time, all her free time out running in the mountains. And she's been very conscious over the sort of the decades that she's been doing this of noticing the the 
rate of change, um, the rate of ice melt um, in the mountains, which is much faster than it is in um, other e ecosystems and the impact of that. So people sort of look at it and go, well, okay, well, you know, it's a mountain that very few people actually go to and, you know, really what's the big deal here? But Carol's really good at explaining how this um, connects to our lives um, and the fact that, you know, we rely on this ecosystem that water from there, the meltwater feeds the, um, right. the sort of agriculture um, in that area and industry that we rely on for a lot of the goods that we use. So she's got this amazing um, project, this um, sort of uh, mountain climate run, is it, James? That she's oh. it? Yeah, so um, the, she's, she's running the, um, the Himalayan Trail which is wow. a 1500 kilometer trail. Um, she doesn't she go over the peaks, the world. but goes bloody high. Wow. <laughs> and she's just amazing and phenomenal. Um, yes. And so she's got her own um, fundraising platform um, for that's just launched basically to fund her, her trail run um, so that she can document it and those changes which are happening in what you know what can be called the third pole because after the north and yeah. south pole the himalayas is effectively the third pole it's the next fastest oh. place that like climate change is really having a, 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 an accelerated and dramatic impact on on lives traditions cultures and ways of life so um one of the ways that we're helping um sort of bring people who live in tokyo and maybe not connecting um, their lifestyles to the, those impacts and, and maybe not have um, such a clear idea of how they could make some simple changes and choices in their life that would start moving things in a better direction. We're holding this, we're hosting this event um, called Mela. So Mela is um, in the Indian subcontinent. It refers to a kind of bazaar or kind of cultural festival. Um, and we basically are holding something, one of those and bringing together other people connected to the Himalayan culture um, so there's our neighbors actually in Nakamagro, Adi um, and Chia Chiaba, um, so amazing restaurant and Himalayan tea um, shop, best chai in the world, and now they <laughs> have a tea brand, um, Sun Chai Peanut Butter, A Boat of Snow, the fashion brand, um, whose uh, one his co-founder is uh, from Tibet, um, Yeti Roastery, which is an amazing um, coffee brand that's uh, grown in the Himalayan foothills. Um, and so we're basically putting that on on Saturday, next Saturday, uh, the 6th of July. So come on down, sign up, come on down to Nakamura. It's going to be really fun. Uh, you can try some stuff out. So thanks for getting the plug in. And please, I think the link to Carol's uh, platform is, is on that Peertix link as well. So do check her out and support her because she's an amazing woman on an incredibly important mission. Yeah, awesome. I'm I'm so excited for all the collaborative work that all of you guys are doing. So much of what you all are doing is connected to so many other businesses and so many other people who are doing great things. Um, that's the label or the slogan for the show, Seek Sustainable Japan, right? Good people doing great things. And I think it extends far beyond just the people I have on my show. I, I've heard so many great stories about connections elsewhere. And as I feel happy to be a little bit of, of a part of that. So yeah, you, you nice. kicked it all, you sure. and Tova kicked it all off with the Women cool. to Inspire Sustainable Japan two years ago, right? Which, <laughs> yeah, it, you know, it's made so many um, friends and meaningful connections there. So yeah, just um, being inspired by you and the uh, all, all the um, inspirational content and people that you bring on your show. Congratulations again. Yeah. Thank okay. you. Thank you so much. So we got two more minutes. Uh, Ruth, Tova, and James were talking about an event they're excited about. Anything coming up for you? Um, not in terms of events, lots of, of client work going on. Um, so sort of projects within that. But I, I want to go back to James's point about questions for you, actually. Okay, okay. We got two minutes. So, yeah. <laughs> most, James, you had a really um, good question. What was it? Well, yeah, what was it? Most okay, most um of all the 499 so <laughs> that you've done today, which show was the most, okay, insert adjective, Ruth. Uh, <laughs> impactful. Oh, Ooh. good one. Oh, impactful for me or I've heard from other people? Well, yeah, <laughs> but either, one, either one is fine. Either one? <laughs> oh, um, I think 
all of you guys, all of the talks with you guys has definitely been my favorite. And such I will a political say, answer. I will such, say so, the same thing answer. to the next group, I'm afraid. <laughs> 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 That's too difficult. I can't choose. No, seriously. Okay. Every every talk I've done, yeah. I've gotten so much out of it. And yeah. then some talks I'm like, oh, no, I didn't have a chance to talk about this. Or I didn't have a chance to talk about that. Oh, no. Like, I, I try to prep as much as I can. Um, but then people will say, oh, wow, I really got a lot out of that or, mm. you know, and, and so I feel like even if I get out what I can or uh, introduce uh, what I can about them and you can't talk about everything, yeah. um, but maybe sometimes that's enough, you know, yeah, just trying yeah. to keep it positive and, yeah. and promote the good work other yeah. people are doing. Okay. Love, just giving them a voice. Then, just to tag on that real quickly. Uh, the thing that I wanted to plug is that Jarman International just acquired DeepJapan.org, so we're going to have our own media. So I hope that this can also become a good platform for all the people here and all the interesting things you're doing in a in an article sort of way. So that'll come out. We're rebranding, and it should come out in October. So that's, that's awesome. Well, awesome. Thank you. Yeah, great, Ruth. Uh, thank you, guys. That's the 30 minutes. I got another group waiting in the waiting room. <laughs> so I got to say goodbye, and we'll try to do it again soon. I think yeah. it would be great to have an hour long with all of you guys. Nice yeah. seeing you guys. Yeah. Thank great. you. Thank you. Enjoy, Enjoy the rest of it. Enjoy. Good luck, Joy. Congratulations. Congratulations. Bye. Bye. Congrats. playing games with my brain And I've been getting colder at night I don't think so much about what's right I just pour a glass and let the evening pass and in the end, I give up without a Just carry on as if nothing's wrong, and I'll let you 